Okay guys, so I have a confession to make. I sort of stopped making vintage videos, not because I stopped liking the watches, but you guys just don't watch them. But I wanted to get to the bottom of this, so I opened a poll on watchcrunch.com, and based on the votes, nearly 60% of you said that you avoid vintage, not because you don't love the watches, but because you're worried about the pitfalls surrounding maintenance and authenticity. Luckily, our resident vintage expert, Chrono Triggered, posted a extensive vintage buying guide the other day. So in this video, I'm gonna show you my latest vintage scores, including this Omega, tell you about how to shop for a vintage watch without losing your shirt. Hey guys, I'm Max and this is Watch Crunch. It's always great to see your beautiful faces, especially to talk about this neglected topic. Watch Crunch is a modern platform for talking watches, in this case, a fountain of knowledge that you can tap into to research your next watch purchase. The newest addition to my vintage arsenal is this Omega Soccer Timer from the 1960s. It's called that because the watch was designed for coaches and officials to use for monitoring a soccer match. It has colorful subdials, and the minute counter features an additional 45 minute mark to denote each half of a soccer match. How useful is this? Well, I don't really play soccer, but I'm here for the pretty colors. So I've lusted after one of these vintage soccer timers for years now, but where did I start? How did I decide to pull the trigger on this one? So people always say do your research, but what does that mean? In this case, a quick Google search reveals that the soccer timer had three different references and came in two case sizes. The earlier models came in this 38 millimeter size and the later reference at 41. There were also numerous style variations, all with red accents. This watch comes out of what I consider to be the golden age of chronographs, right before the quartz crisis in the 60s, early 70s. Manufacturers had access to a lot of movement choices and they went up to each other on striking colors and fancy dials. Looking around the internet, you can find a lot of bargains from this era from brands like Omega, Universal Genève, Wittenauer, and Wackman. Many of them don't really exist anymore. Now, if you put the work in up front, you're rewarded with unique pieces that no one else will have at your next watch meet. There is just a level of respect that you get from fellow watch nerds when you turn up with something vintage with a story attached to it. Secondly, compared to a pristine new watch wrapped in plastic, wearing something this old gives you a sense of time itself. Yes, the box and papers are gone with the wind, but from the fading on the dial to the patina of the loom to even the scuffs on the case, you just get a sense that this thing is alive. And maybe you're simply the current caretaker of it. But the other side of the coin is that you have to be mindful of condition when you're shopping for vintage watches. And more importantly, you have to always be willing to walk away from a watch that doesn't look or feel right. And if you've done your research, you'll have some sense of what you're looking for. A vintage case should not look brand new, but also check for signs of over polishing. Things like loss of sharp demarcations between polished and brushed surfaces, smoothing out of the case back engravings and the logo on the bracelet clasps. Dials can also be repainted, so sometimes you can notice variations in color, especially around the indices and also check the crispness of the font and the printing. Lastly, check the condition of the movement. Does it have any rust? Is it even the correct caliber? This means always asking to have the case open and if buying online, asking for movement pictures and maybe videos of the watch running. These watches are not going to be as resistant to water or magnetism. Their acrylic crystals will scratch more easily. They won't be as accurate as your brand new chronometer. But that's not the point, right? I mean, ask a vintage car owner if he cares what the zero to 60 is in his air-cooled 911. Another big fear is Franken watches, or watches that harbor parts from many unoriginal sources. Now, this one can be a bit difficult to discern for the untrained eye, but you can look for dials that are just too clean for the age of the watch hands that look too shiny because you would expect the steel to have oxidized over the decades. Look at the loom on the hands, make sure they match that of the dial, and make sure the logo and brand name is period correct on the front as well as on the case back. If the watch looks too good to be true, meaning it's too perfect for its age, then it most likely is. 
And above all else, buy the seller, not the watch. Sellers with a history will be less likely to risk their reputation by ripping you off. And they're also more likely to give you a refund if something goes wrong. The other thing about going vintage is instead of spending your energy schmoozing your AD, you really want to consider befriending a watchmaker. Sure, you can find some killer deals on eBay for vintage watches, but don't be tempted by the low price alone. Always budget a few hundred dollars for service. Now you might get lucky and get one that runs well, but half the time I've had to service a vintage watch as soon as it landed in my hands. For example, this Omega runs a Lemania derived caliber 861, the same one as used in Speedmasters of the day. But when I got it, it was malfunctioning and the start and stop pusher would also reset the chrono hand. Now, I know the A61 is not a flyback, so I took it to my watchmaker who quickly discovered that the resetting lever was gunked up, causing the problem. The great thing is most mechanical watches can be fixed by a resourceful watchmaker, but you have to find someone with a can-do attitude that's willing to just get in there, see what's going on without knowing all the variables. This is the first generation dynamic. Again, we're greeted with a fancy dial with a big orange second hand. You see what I'm saying about the 60s? With the dynamic, the engineer set out to create the most ergonomic watch in history. Even though it's 41 millimeters wide, given its oblong shape, it rests beautifully in that little concavity between the bones of the wrist, which is called the radius and the ulna for you anatomy nerds. What are some last things to avoid when going vintage? Now, vintage usually means older than 25 years, but not like 100 year old antiques. But notice that I've focused on a couple of decades that are relatively recent because I'm still a novice, all things considered. And if you go back a lot further, you can get into trouble with things like pin pallet movements. They were cheap alternatives to the Swiss lever system and not known for their reliability. Now, how do you tell? Well, pop the back. But also, you're safe with watches that say Inca block or generally have 15 jewels or more. I also personally avoid anything vintage quartz because my watchmaker doesn't dabble in that, but your mileage may vary. So as you can tell, the rabbit hole can get deep rather quickly, but in any case, buying vintage is a high risk, high reward endeavor. I recommend that you keep your emotions in check, do your research and make sure you befriend a watchmaker who can help you look these things over. And if you do that, you can open yourself up to a whole world of interesting timepieces full of patina and soul. But guys, let me know if this has been helpful. If you have any other pointers, any questions on the topic, I'll put a link in the pinned comments below to a longer discussion on watch crunch. Thank you to Chrono Triggered for all of your wisdom. Stay crunchy. I'll see you in the next one.